Hi, and welcome to our webinar today. It's called Can You Believe It? Evaluating Information Sources for Credibility. I'm Marianne Cullen from Alpharetta and Online, and with me presenting today is Pat Zebart from the Dunwoody campus. I was actually an online student myself, so I know what it's like to always wonder who the people are that are talking to me. <coughs> and um, so this is me. Um, I'm at Alpharetta and online, and this is my contact information. And this is Pat at Dunwoody, although I think we've both changed our hair since we took these pictures, but whatever. We're close enough to that. So what we're going to cover today is Pat's going to talk a bit at first about evaluating sources in general, um, particularly what's a scholarly source. Um, so including some search strategies to get better sources, and actually at the end we'll talk about how to get some help. I'm going to talk about news sources and social media and issues around fake news and how to evaluate news sources. So I'm going to pass the ball over to Pat. Okay, you're going to be the presenter. Advancing okay. the slides. Let's go back to the beep version. The what version? When I beep, when we're going to go ahead. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think this will work out fine. One of our more fun and flamboyant professors here at Dunwoody um, talks to his classes about information sources, especially the kind of information sources you could find on the web. And he says, you know, the web is full of a lot of things. You might find in diamonds, but more than likely you're going to find a lot of voodoo. <laughs> and um, he says that part of becoming educated is to learn exactly how to find those diamonds and avoid uh, the doo-doo that's out there online. So um, as librarians, that is one of the things that we teach classes all the time, how to be selective and uh, savvy about the, the sources that you find. Beep. Go to the next slide. Thanks. Uh, uh, just a little uh, acronym that we n use uh, to help remember the checklist of things that are really important to uh, determine what you need when you're doing your, your work, and this is especially true for academic work, um, is you uh, use this thing called a CRAP test, and it has these five checkpoints. I will go over them real quickly. Uh, currency, relevance, authority, accuracy, and purpose. Uh, and we uh, will kind of look at look at them individually, and you can also um, uh, add your comments. As I said before, if you would like to join in the conversation, feel free to do that. You can use the hand uh, raise, and Marianne will look for that while I'm talking, and I'll look for that while she's talking so that we can get you involved in the conversation as well. Okay, the kinds of things we're talking about today are not only going to be for the web, they're going to be about any kind of information source that you look for. But I will tell you right up front that my bias is, and my, one of the things I'm trying to do today is to be a booster for the kinds of resources we have through the library, um, mostly through our online databases. It's not that I am anti-Google. I love Google. I use it all the time. Um, it's just that I do have oftentimes a bias for public public sources, for published sources, because they have some form of editorial review where just about anything can happen on the web. Um, that's why I believe that we need to apply the crap test when you're doing things on the web even more so. Another bias that I would say, I'll confess to you right at the beginning, is that I have uh, a bias for the values of uh, academic work. And I think that's really important in the context of the kinds of assignments you have to do when you're in college or university. So the values there would be um, reason and evidence, data, and the scientific method. Um, it's not that other values don't apply in my life. It's that when I'm doing academic work, those are the values that are paramount. So now to applying the CRAP test. Um, the first criteria is currency which really just has to do with how new or old is the source that you are um, examining. On published sources, it's really quite easy because there's a publication date involved. Uh, in terms of environmental studies, um, obviously, the 
source over on the left, which was published in 1888, is going to be uh, quite different than the source that's on the right, which just was published uh, a year or so ago. Um, can you think of situations where the source on the right might actually be helpful? And Okay, did I say source on the left? You know, the one about the farmhouse, the old New York Times article? I mean, um, studying history. Sometimes we dig back into older sources. Uh, generally, if we're doing science or current events, we want the sources to be a little bit more current. Um, as I said, it's easier to tell on published sources because the dates are there for when they, uh, the um, piece was published. It's harder to tell sometimes on the web. And so part of what you need to do for your due diligence when you're using a website for academic purposes is to make sure uh, if currency is important that the site was published or updated recently. And the way to do that is to look around usually the perimeter of the website uh, to see the date when it was uh, created or the date when it was updated. You have to always ask yourself, are the sources, um, are, do I need the most up-to-date sources? Um, so that's one of the first things you ask. The other thing is, if you look at a website and you find that there are a lot of 404 errors, file not found, that is the links have rotted, that could be a real sign that the site is neglected and may be out of date. For both our databases that we have through the library website resources and Google, there are ways that you can uh, use limiters for getting more current information. On our websites, uh, usually on the left, there's always a way to limit, and, and what you'll see is on the right here, but the limits on the website are usually on the left. Um, you can see that there's a slider bar or sometimes e uh, a timeline or sometimes just a way where you can type in the dates to determine uh, how recent you want that information. And in Google, if you've never seen this before, there is a tool uh, list right under the search box and you can uh, limit to any of those choices there anytime or really recently, the past year, or even put in a custom range for when uh, the websites were published. Okay, so those are just some tips you have to get the most current uh, information if that's what you determine you need for your project. Uh, the next criteria in our, in our CREP test checklist is the criteria of relevance. And that is one where you definitely have to know what your information need is before you start. As I mentioned, usually for college level work, you're going to need those things that are based on reason and scientific evidence uh, or, or different forms of evidence rather than necessarily opinion-based things. Of course, opinion can be backed up by uh, a lot of evidence and those are important too. When you write persuasive papers, you're going to have to do just that, kind of make a claim and then support it with evidence. Um, but will, will the information source that you're seeking actually match the topic that you're looking for? And, and one of the things about looking for good sources is that um, you may not always find it immediately. You may have to do a little research to do good research and to find the sources that you need. So ask yourself the question, have you looked at enough sources to know that this is right for your paper, your project, your, the thesis that you're taking as you write? Okay, so relevance tips are really important as you do your searching. We're doing a little bit of uh, training in critical thinking and also a little bit in searching technique in this uh, webinar. So one of the relevance tips that will help you get better results as you're searching is to add more and specific search terms in uh, the databases that you use. For instance, uh, if you are doing some work on becoming a nurse, a, a particular kind of nurse, you can put neonatal intensive care as a part of the nursing. You can also actually be specific about the kinds of techniques that you um, are interested in teaching or uh, advocating for your patients and their families. Uh, you can also add a geographic limiter. If you 
perhaps are getting too many results from uh, different places in the world and that doesn't, isn't relevant. It doesn't apply to the kind of research question that you're asking. So, so once again, you can use more terms to get specific results. You can actually use unique terms as I did on this search where I was using the term kangaroo care that I wouldn't have known about unless I'd done a little pre-research to know what I uh, needed to ask for. Um, and the other thing is, whether in a database or in Google, do not assume that the first few results you get are the most relevant. Uh, they are algorithms that try to feed you the most relevant articles, but that's not always what happens, so please go beyond the first page of results. Okay. This uh, adding of keywords and more specific keywords really is good for um, Google, too. Uh, you can see that uh, there are two searches that were done in Google here in the slide. One was the specific term kangaroo care, which isn't bad. Uh, we didn't get a Google of results. We didn't get in the millions, but we still did get a whole lot of results. And there's also a very nice um, page that came up right away with a quick definition of what kangaroo care is. But if I were really looking for uh, scholarly articles or something that would help me link to my career or my future career, and I'm writing that up for a paper in the nursing program, I probably would want to add more specific terms and get fewer results that are more targeted targeted to the kind of inquiry I'm doing for my project or paper. So another thing that we have in our databases that we do not ordinarily have in Google is when you get a results list, there's often something called an abstract, which is a short summary of the article. That doesn't substitute for reading the whole article, but it helps you quickly judge whether it's worth reading that entire article. Um, you'll be able to tell how relevant the article is by reading the abstract. Okay, the next criteria is credibility, and it has a lot to do with who is the author of whatever piece you're looking at, be that a web piece or something uh, from uh, a journal or a magazine. Is the author actually an expert or someone who's just interviewed and consulted with experts and then tried to report accurately on what they discovered? Is it someone with personal experience? Is it someone who has opinions but little or no expertise? So those are the kinds of questions that involve credibility. One of the top types of authority in the academic realm is a scholarly article from a peer-reviewed journal. And here uh, is an example of such an article. It is actually done, the article is written by the researchers who did the, um, the study. In this case, they're researchers on diabetes. And they are reporting on the findings that they did in their scientific study. So they have lots of authority. Now, it doesn't mean that sometimes scientific studies don't make some mistakes that have to be retracted. That does happen, but there is a mechanism for retracting uh, any problems. And this peer review system means that before something gets published, the article has to be reviewed by other experts in the field. Then it would be published. So it, there are lots of checkpoints along the way so that there won't be a lot of inaccurate information or uh, bad information put up on peer-reviewed uh, websites, peer-reviewed uh, journal articles. Let's go to the next one. The next level down of authority might be that um, the person who is writing the article, again, not for scholarly journal, but for a popular magazine, is a committed journalist who has um, gone out and sought the opinion of uh, the experts in the field and then written up the article after consulting with the experts. In fact, this journalist uh, actually talked to the author of the preceding study. So that's another uh, type of authority, someone who has talked to the expert. The other thing that you would need to know is when you use our databases, as opposed to just searching on the web, you have a way to immediately limit your sources to scholarly peer-reviewed journals. Once again, those expert sources uh, written by usually the people who have done the actual academic study 
can be that medical or some other kind of academic study. So that's a great way to make sure you're getting credible uh, and reliable high quality studies. Uh, the other thing you can do is look for the on the web, if you don't have a limiter button, as we do in the databases, to just look for the credentials of the people who have put up that web uh, site. And if you don't know anything other than the person's name, it is also okay to Google that person to see what other kinds of things they've done. For instance, Jennifer Friedman has written many, many articles uh, covering medical things for the popular media. And Michael Danziger is associated with um, uh, a, a, uh, an academic position so that we would know then that he can be trusted. Another kind of authority is perhaps not the individual author, but the organization that's sponsoring the website. So again, if we're asking questions about diabetes and what we should know about diabetes, we could look for a, an organization that, uh, that sponsors research and sponsors their main purpose is to get out information uh, about that particular topic. And for whatever topic you're looking for, um, you're going to find organizations that are really uh, considered to be stakeholders. Now, they may have different opinions, but they are highly vested in, in the topic and, uh, and hopefully try to do credible work. Okay, the next checkpoint is is accuracy. Sometimes that's a little bit hard for when you're first researching a topic to know what's accurate information and what's not. But the goal here is to find out if the facts are correct or they're really far off base. Uh, and so there are some ways that we can try to determine how accurate the information source is we're looking at. Uh, one of the things that we can do is actually to do some fact checking. Make sure that the information on the website or even in the published source you find is supported by facts that are observable uh, and involve measurable data. Uh, if you uh, just hear people's opinion and there is absolutely nothing, no data to back it up, that's one reason to be a little suspicious about the facts. Uh, another uh, thing to do is to look in other independent sources, and Marianne will talk about this a little more, I think, in the newspaper section, is you look for sources different from the one that you're examining to kind of corroborate or uh, check to see that the source, the information in your source uh, is, is backed up in several different places. Um, and um, make sure that you don't suspend your own common sense. Uh, the information that you find should be consistent with some very basic things that you already know. If you're doing historical research, you'll know uh, things about American history uh, that are, are basic and common knowledge and make sure that what uh, you're reading uh, doesn't contradict things that you've known from the past. On the other hand, don't be so sure that you know everything, because if you knew everything, then this whole process of education, which teaches us new things, would be uh, not as worthwhile. So you have to kind of maintain that balance between skepticism and some confidence in your basic knowledge and ability. Okay, the other thing for, we'll go one more, two more slides for accuracy, I guess. Um, accuracy of sources also has to do with uh, a source being willing to cite other sources, other reputable um, articles, uh, make sure that a source will say where they got their information and that those places where they got their information are of high quality. Again, I'm saying my bias here for academic work and that surely is the kind of work that you will do mostly while you're in the university and as you go on to your major. Uh, and I'm talking way too much, so I'm going to go super fast. Uh, the uh, websites, um, be careful on accuracy. If it's a sloppy website, it probably has sloppy information. Be really careful of social media because uh, social media can make any kind of claim and often does. So be sure you go out there and fact check everything. Uh, you can use Snopes. Uh, or you can use uh, some other, or uh, factcheck.com. 
uh, an accuracy tip then is try using selected Google Sky sites like Google Scholar, uh, which limits your uh, your results to books or educational sites. And uh, again, use those library sites because there's a measure of accountability and acceptability in the things that we've chosen for the library sites. Final thing, final criteria uh, is purpose. Why was that information published in the first place? Most of the academic things we have are really to advance knowledge. Uh, and so that is fairly trustworthy. A lot of things, dot com was invented to sell something. Uh, even works by scholars, though, will oftentimes do things that are biased toward their sponsoring organizations. And so that's something you always have to use your critical thinking to uh, evaluate. The other thing is some things are just uh, written to entertain. Uh, and uh, some are, well, information kind of goes, goes with advancing knowledge. Some are written just to inflame. And we've seen a whole lot of that lately in our, in our culture. Let's go to the next slide. Um, be sure if you can kind of tell if the purpose is for selling something, even if a doctor's name is on it. Let's go on. <laughs> um, and it, it's sometimes easy to tell if the purpose is to entertain or inform. There are a lot of comedy or satiric websites out there posing as being news, but uh, be careful. What, the Onion is one such site. Uh, be very careful. Uh, uh, look again at a website in the About section. Science News is a very simple but a very bona fide uh, site that seeks to share scientific information. The final thing is, once again, uh, if you sense that the purpose of a website is to inflame, um, make definitely put a checkpoint on that and do a lot of fact checking for accuracy uh, and for purpose. Um, Bonafide, trustworthy websites may have bias, but they will usually admit their bias up front or make sure that they're trying to present something in an objective and balanced way, rather than using illogical or emotional appeals, uh, especially if there is a lot of name calling uh, on a site. You can uh, almost always guess that the purpose of that is to inflame rather than to uh, advance uh, human knowledge or to inform. Okay, final slide. Uh, the diamond advice is always use your critical thinking skills. Uh, understand your information needs. Does it need to be uh, new information? Um, should it be from a scholarly source, or could you trust a reporter who has done the communication with experts? And then try always to uh, get your information from reliable sources and become a crap detector. Okay, Mary Ann, thank you for advancing my slides, and I'm sorry, all participants, that I went so fast through some of the okay. points. But review that crap test, and always use your critical thinking when you're uh, examining sources. And yes, now, you, Mary Pat. Ann will bring you the news. Thank you. I had to mute a couple of you because I was getting a lot of background noise. That doesn't mean I don't want to hear what you have to say. So either raise your hand or type in the chat box, and I'll be happy to unmute you if you have something to say. So I'm going to talk about the news, and a lot of what I have to say you will see reflects what Pat said, uh, but it's specifically about news sources and some of the issues that are special to news sources. So this is the way ideally the news is supposed to work. There's a journalist, a reporter, who does a lot of research about the study, looks at all different sides of the study, fact checks and one, two, three independent sources to make sure that the information they're saying is true. They present it in an objective way or present multiple sides of the story. And then they follow up as needed if there's more information that comes out or uh, something like that. They'll follow up and say, oh, we found out something about what we reported yesterday that might change what you think about it. And they'll go ahead and follow up in that way. Real news, like newspapers and TV shows, et cetera, will sometimes have editorials and commentary and opinion. Those have always been a feature of the news. But it's clearly laid out that this is a, an editorial. It will say opinion on it, for example. Um, it'll tell you that the author is a columnist as opposed to a reporter. 
and it might give you an idea. He, this one is a conservative columnist, so that you already know where Kyle Wingfield stands on this issue. There's also the issue of the editor or news director, and they decide what stories are going to be in their publication or on their news program based on the importance of the story and the interest of their viewers. And news directors can have a lot of influence on the news, even though they're not the ones reporting it, they choose what stories you hear. So that can be certainly a kind of bias in its own. These journalists follow, ideally, a journalistic code of ethics. This is an actual document from the Society of Professional Journalists that talk about seeking truth and reporting it, not to harm their subjects, um, to act independently, and to be accountable. And there's the whole list of ways that that is supposed to happen here. Um, and this is I, fake news and bias news is not new. It's a hot topic right now, but it has gone on throughout history. People have always, you know, listened to rumor and gotten excited about things. But there was, I think it's things have changed more recently. So there was a famous journalist back in the 50s and 60s named Walter Cronkite, who was who catchphrase was most trusted man in America. And I, I don't know that this was fact checked, that there were actually polls about if he was the most trusted man or not. But that was the, the, the term that was frequently used. And you didn't know what Walter Cronkite thought. It was it, it was an objective presentation of the news. People trusted him to do a good job and have good journalistic integrity. The reason that having accurate news is so important is that people take this information that they learn in the news to vote for people, which certainly has a big impact on our lives, um, to in their purchases, so where they spend their money, and in their health. Are they... Are they doing things that will make them healthy based on the news? So you can see where there could be some things that could go wrong on e in each of these in each of these categories here. So one of the reasons things go wrong is that news sources generally have to make money. They have to be able to pay the people who do the news and they're you know, stay on the air. So they ha they are trying to appeal to people so that the the advertisers will sponsor them so they can continue to make their news program. And so they tend to go for the things that will get people to watch the show. Another thing that can be a problem is if there are sponsors for the uh, the news show. So if McDonald's, for example, is one of the the people advertising on the news, uh, the the reporter might be more uh, reluctant to talk about the hazards of fast food. They're not going to be critical of their advertiser or their parent company. Disney owns Disney and ABC own uh, I think Disney owns ABC own a lot of media organizations. There's actually only just a few media organizations now. They've consolidated and consolidated and consolidated. And so if you're listening to a review on ABC about a Disney movie, are they really being objective or are they trying to promote their parent company's movie? So another thing that goes wrong is is the issue of 24-hour news networks. There was a, a phrase that is of uh, questionable origin uh, who said it first? I think I think I did my research and it's Alfred Harmsworth. But anyway, that said, when a dog bites a man, that is not news because it happens so often. But if a man bites a dog, this is news. Now, 24-hour news networks, they have to fill up 24 hours a day of news and suddenly you've got dog bites man in the news. For example, here's a story that was on CNN at one point that the a breaking news story was that the Titanic sunk 102 years ago that night. So I don't think this surprised anybody, but they called it breaking news. So that creates a false sense of urgency with the viewers. There's also a thing called circular reporting, and this is 
this is related to what Pat was talking about with independent sources. So we really only have a few organizations that really originate national level news in our country. The New York Times would be one, the Washington Post would be one, um, the Associated Press, I, know, I can't name them all. But so the problem comes in with this is if they start reporting from each other and then somewhere along the line this gets lost. Um, so if 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 Reuters reports that the New York Times says something and the AP says that Reuters said something and the New York Times says it came from AP, they're just copying each other and there really was only one original story. There need to be three independent reporters that report this different thing or else it becomes circular reporting and things can just get really out of control. So another thing that happens is that that uh, more and more because of the need to attract viewers, what was at one point an unbiased anchor starts to creep into the opinion category. And Bill O'Reilly was one of the worst offenders, in my opinion. He's no longer on Fox News. But um, so they use they use uh, words and and. You can tell the opinion of the newscaster, which used to be real taboo. So I'm I'm not trying to pick on any particular newscasters or any particular network. So I've tried to choose different examples, but <clears throat> here are, here are some examples: the terminology of dangerous rhetoric on college campuses, campus craziness, and then here um, heel gaze and quotes and blasted some inflammatory language there. I get the slide to advance. Okay, so here's another example of inflammatory language. This is obviously stories from today. Um, so Trump called on the NFL to outlaw anthem protests. So the term outlaw and blasting, and then as opposed to ABC News, it just says he wants a rule. So there's a difference between outlawing and just having a rule. So that's just the most recent example I could find. So here's a uh, an example from longer ago where it depends on how the news organization spins the story. And these are all story, the exact same story reported by different organizations. So the national, I forget what the NOAA is, but the uh, is accused of manipulating global warming data. A whistleblower claims the flawed study was a major influence in the 2015 Paris Climate Summit. Different source, Washington Post, as as the planet warms, doubters launch a new attack on the famous climate change study. And in the New York Times, there was no data manipulation, the researchers say. And in InfoWars, which is renowned for being inflammatory, the scientists manipulated the temperature data to make global warming seem worse. Irrefutable evidence say the study relied on unverified data. So especially if you just read the headlines and not the story, you would get a totally different impression of what this story was, uh, but even the stories were pretty inflammatory and biased. Another technique that, that they use without actually saying something is they'll ask a leading question. They'll lead, they're not leading the witness, they're leading the viewer. So, for example, are anti-fascist uh, professors brainwashing the kids into hating cops and Republicans? That's part of the campus craziness story. Or on um, the CNN website, is Cooper saying it's the president for all or just supremacists? Now, he may not actually address that, but it's enough to make you as the viewer think that maybe, hey, the president's just, you know, for supremacists or whatever they are trying to get you think. So another thing they do to kind of mislead you, and this has less to do with bias, but just more misleading, is they present statistics in a very questionable way. This is a statistic, this is from a while ago, about what would happen if the Bush tax cuts expired. And it looks like uh, the, the change would be very, very dramatic if the tax cuts expired. But if you'll notice, the data start at 34%. So if you actually started at zero, the difference between 34 and 39.6 is not that great. 
but it sure looks dramatic here. So you need to be careful about that. And remember when Pat was talking about how education can prevent some of this, this is the kind of stuff you learn in statistics class. So another thing, I don't know if Fox is still doing this, but the Fox kept having this thing called Fox Facts. And what they did is they took a poll. And a, a poll is an opinion. It's maybe the results of the poll are a fact, but it's not a fact that whatever these people think. That's somebody's opinion. And I question how did they conduct this? Is this just Fox viewers or is this, you know, who did how did they get this data? So a much better way to do this is to give some information about when you collected the data, who were the people that answered the poll, and this one on the right is even better where it says exactly what question they asked, gave the source, tells how they conducted the poll, when, and the degree of accuracy of, of the poll. I'm sorry, I'm going to skip that one because of time. So another thing to be aware of is social media. More and more people are getting their news from social media. And they may not intentionally, like I don't go to Facebook for my news, but I have friends that post about social issues, post about news items on social media. And so I inadvertently learn things on social media. And then I have to go try to track down a real story. So up to 62% uh, are getting news to some amount on social media. So social media in itself, uh, the algorithm that they use to present you with stories can influence the news that you see. So this, these are actually examples from my own personal Facebook feed, which is why I blacked out people's names. Um, so I got a suggested post, and this is based on what my friends think, what I've clicked on, what um, other things I've looked up or what stories I followed. So they, they come up with suggested posts. Um, I, my friend commented on this. That makes it more likely that I would see it. Um, So-and-so reacted to this. Um, and another thing I've gotten is that It'll say so and so and so and so like Upworthy or like the New York Times, and it'll give me a story. These friends did not like that, you know, like in social media way that particular story. They just liked the New York Times. So I'm seeing stories that my friends might not even have made any kind of comment on. They just liked the, the New York Times or Upworthy or whatever it is, and then sharing the link. So, so this creates uh, an information bubble or echo chamber. So what I'm presented with over and over and over again are the things that my friends or I am likely to agree with. I happen to have friends who have widely divergent opinions, but quite often we have friends who think like we do, and so we see the same thing over and over again and, and don't really see the other opinion. The other, I'm acting like there's two sides, but I think you understand what I mean. Oh, here. Okay, so then um, another thing to be aware of about social media is the phenomenon of citizen journalism. It used to be the newspapers and magazines and news sources we saw were all produced by professionals, not the average person. But social media has enabled us for the average person to participate in journalism where they can take images or post blogs or or create their own stories, and they are not bound by any kind of journalistic integrity. Now, this can be a great thing. For example, I mean, not being bound by journalistic integrity, but this is a picture from Hurricane Katrina that was taken by someone who was there. So they were able to present this very moving image that gave you some information about what was going on there when the reporters couldn't get in. But at the same time, they don't have, uh, they don't, they're not obligated to present multiple sides of a story. So now you hear more and more of this term fake news. So we've been talking about evaluating news sources. Uh, we're all talking about, so far, real stories that just were presented in, in uh, you know, varying degrees of accuracy or bias. Uh, but fake news 
is not just disagreeable or inconvenient information. It is not things that you just happen to not believe that are scientific findings. They're not opinion pieces. They're not spin and they're not satire. Those are all different. Fake news are things that are truly false or distorted intentionally, to rep but they're represented as truth and disseminated as though they are reliable reporting. So here's an example of a fake news story, and it looks completely legitimate because it looks like it's CNN, um, but quite often these fake news sites will have a .de or a .co after what looks like the legitimate uh, URL, and it is completely fake. This does not have anything to do with CNN. They basically stole the logo and stuck a fake story on there. And I'm going to let Pat talk about this one. Okay. Um, Paul Horner was someone who, uh, post last election, was uh, interviewed on a lot of news shows because he unabashedly came out and said that he uh, affected the the um, result of the election. And he did it by creating some outrageous news stories that had absolutely no basis in reality. He just sat in his living room and made them up. And so um, he claimed on the news stories that what he was trying to do is demonstrate to the American public how easily they could be fooled. But more than likely, his motivation was that he made six figures of income from the advertisements that came on his fake news site. So basically that's um that that is just a story of one purveyor of uh of fake news. Their motivation may not have anything to do with politics. They they may not have any investment in the type of stories that they put out, but they're highly invested in making some money from this endeavor by uh, making up these fake news sites or news stories. And that's very, very different from um, a uh, satire site like The Onion, which pretends to be a newspaper, but it's commonly known and in the About section made very clear that that is just for purposes of entertainment and comedy and satire. It's not portrayed as being real news the way Paul Horner puts uh, put this information out. Okay. Yeah, so okay. This is abcnews.com.co. So, that's another example of a time that the the URL was a tip off. So, um like Pat said, satire and comedy, these are all common um comedy representations of the news, the Daily Show, John Oliver, uh, Seth Meyers and Saturday Night Live. And actually a lot of people get real information from them. There's quite a bit of reality mixed up with the satire, but they're not trying to be unbiased. They're trying to be amusing. So there is a danger in getting your news as with these as your primary source. So so be on guard in terms of, of relying on them as your, your sole information source. Good. Could I just say one more thing? Sure. Um, and that is that uh, uh, there have been documentation that a lot of the fake news purveyors on the web were picked up by, um, I, I would say, more, um, and I hate to put these labels on, but more conservative people would see something that they didn't like about a politician and repost it. Um, and they were fooled mm -hmm. by fake news more. Uh, but the, peop the people who are fooled by the satire comedy oftentimes are liberal people who think that that is real news and that's the only source that they have for getting their real news. So for anybody, I think making sure you seek out balanced sources of your news is super important. Uh, it's just as bad for liberals to think that the Daily Show is their only news source as it is for someone to be fooled by a fake news uh, source that leans to the right. Yeah, quite often they'll they'll edit some of the speeches or whatever they're presenting for humorous effect. I mean, they'll leave out a sentence or whatever and then make fun of it. So, um, you know, even if you're seeing something that 
say the president really said, you might have said something else too. So, exactly. Um, so why are we so susceptible to this? You know, we we like to think we're smarter than that, right? Um, well, it's human nature to want simple, definitive answers now. We're impatient. I mean, who has all day, every day to go track down the right information in the news? Um, the confirmation bias, we tend to think that things are we already think are true, and so we look for reports that reinforce, and possibly unintentionally. And, and you know, when Pat was talking about, you know, do, is it consistent with what you already know, it doesn't necessarily mean your belief. I mean, you have there's a certain amount of of um, healthy skepticism, I guess, where you need to be able to look at something and go that if I if if this is where we got the name of the webinar, it's like if you if you look at something, I just can't believe that. Well, fact check it. And oftentimes there are emotional appeals to get us to watch. You know, local news is terrible about this, just preying on your emotions and getting you to watch and watch and watch and watch. And this happens with 24-hour news networks, too. They're constantly going, oh, coming up next, we have this shocking story. Like, oh, my goodness, what is that, you know? So what can you do if you get confused about this? So there are some fact, there, there are watchdog groups. Um, that try to fact check these things. These are some of the well known ones the PolitiFact, factcheck.org, and Snopes. Now, there are people who find these biased also, but there is an attempt there to be, to be, uh, present actual information. Uh, I have put together a news evaluation guide at this URL. It's research.library.gsu.edu slash news evaluation. Um, and it includes these three fact testing sites, as well as some other evaluation tools. I've also included on this guide a whole bunch of different videos and articles and different kinds of media about different aspects of news evaluation. Oh, and, and one more thing. On the final page of it, where it says teaching and learning resources, there's a game mm -hmm. you can play to test whether how, how uh, you would fall for fake news or you would not. It's called Factitious. Were you going to get oh. to that, Marianne? Cool. No, no, okay. I didn't. But it's on, I didn't know you the, put that on there. I Thank you. Did. It's the final awesome. on the final page, teaching and learning. And I have to admit, to my great chagrin and embarrassment, that I was duped by a lot of fake news stories. So uh, it's it's interesting to uh, to go ahead and play that game. It's a little like Tinder, where you swipe left if you think it's fake, and swipe right if you think it's true. <laughs> Well, I have to say, I think we, Pat and I played this game at a at a conference where you know you really just had about as much time as you had with Tinder to make a decision. And really, if you were going to look at these stories, I like to think, especially with us being librarians, so if we had actually done some fact checking and had some time, we might have gotten better. <laughs> right. So, a couple of things that are on this guide are a, a, a handout about the crap test and also 10 questions for news detection. Um, and these are the URLs for those things. If you're watching the archive, you can pause this and go see them, but you can also go just to the lib guide and get them, the research guide. And I was so jealous of this crap test that I was determined to make my own <laughs> test. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so it's taken me a while to come up with the, the exact letters that will work, make a word, but I've come up with a fib test. So ask yourself, is it fake? Are the facts accurate? Is it satire or outright fake story? Is it important or is it just being sensationalized to generate interest and an emotional response? And is it biased? Are multiple sides represented? Are the words, images, or the way the story is angled influencing your readers or viewers? Is it an opinion piece or could it be influenced by advertisers or corporate ownership? Nice. You did a great job with the FIB test. Thank you. Um, so you can also ask us, and it's not that we know everything, but we can help you track down some additional information to fact check if you are really curious. You can contact us through Ask a Librarian, or we have a search for an answers down here that will take you to our help and answers page that will give you some research tips. Um, the research guides 
like the one that I showed you are, are accessible from the library homepage on the Research Guides tab. And we have more webinars. One of the research guides is about the webinars. We have more webinars, and the archive for this webinar will be on this page within 24 hours, probably within an hour after this webinar ends. We also have some video tutorials that show you how to use our databases catalog so you can access some of those nifty library resources Pat was talking about. And now, do you have any questions for us? I know we talked a mile a minute. I'm putting up the name of a database that we have. So if you go mm -hmm. to the library homepage and you look for databases by letter, news and newspapers contains links to uh, lots of newspapers um, in our country and around the world. It's sometimes interesting to read to get an international perspective as well. Um, so if you are truly interested in journalism and uh, trying to get read some different papers, I think we have access to the Wall Street Journal, um, New York Times, uh, Washington Post, New York Times, Washington, all three of those do original reporting. So they'll send people out to investigate and do reporting. Plus there's the news wires like uh, Reuters and uh, AP as well. Okay. Thanks. Um, so if you would, whether you are watching this in real time or you are watching the archive, if you would give us some feedback on this webinar and whether it was helpful to you. This survey is actually just two questions in an empty box, so it's pretty easy. Um, but it will help us improve the webinar series and also if you thought it was good, it will help our help us convince our bosses that this is a worthwhile endeavor to present these kind of webinars. So I will attempt to type this into the search box. I have a hard time typing and talking at the same time. Let me time. try to do it for you then, okay. I think I got it. Oh, okay, okay. Good. If that's not it, <laughs> if that's not it, do it for me. So thank you again from me and from Pat. Uh, and this is us, and this is our contact information, and we'll hang out here for a while. I'm going to stop the archive now, um, and I will um, thank you all again for coming.